Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Uh, today we'll be uh, back you know, once again in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18. And while, while y'all are turning there in Jeremiah 18, I want y'all to reflect on this uh, question with me. And that is, uh, when is something gone too far? When is something gone is so bad or so going so horrifically horrible that you just have to throw in the towel? When is something enough enough? Uh, you know, this could be a new hobby that you're picking up, uh, and you know, you're trying this hobby on and off, and it just it doesn't work. You're not good at it. You're not enjoying it. You know what? I've had enough. You know, I've tried to garden. I can't do this. I've had enough. I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done with this. Or perhaps it could be a relationship, maybe a coworker, maybe a friend or a relative, and you know, every conversation you have is just uh, not the best. You try to be positive, you try to, oh yeah, this is going to go good, and it just keeps going downhill, and it gets worse. And you know what? I'm throwing in the towel. Enough is enough. I'm just going to try to be careful, distance myself, so I don't say anything mean or rude. Perhaps it could be a dream or a goal of ours that we've set. And we as, but as life has progressed, there's been many interruptions, many things that have stopped us from progressing that dream of ours. And we say, you know what? This isn't going to happen. I have to give up and change my goals. We all have our limits for the small things and for the big parts of life to where we say, you know what? I can't do anymore. I give up. I'm turning around and doing something else. But as we see in Jeremiah 18, we're going to read that how God is a potter and that how God continues to work with us. He doesn't say for us, enough is enough, I'm giving up on you. But yet he continues to mold us and to be with us as we continue life. So, if you will please join me here in Jeremiah 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah uh, from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house, and there, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Am I not able, house of Israel, to deal with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot it, to tear it down or to destroy it. If that nation which I have spoken uh, turns from its evil, I will relent from the disaster that I have planned to bring on it. Or at a moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will relent of the good which I have said I would, that I would bless it. So now, speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, This is what the Lord says. Behold, I am forming a disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Now turn back each from your evil ways and correct your deeds. But they will say, It's hopeless, for we are going to follow our own plans, and each of us will persist in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to come to your house. We thank you for allowing us to learn more about your word and to worship you freely. Lord, I ask that as we just go throughout this time, Lord, that you teach us more about you and teach us on how we could live. Father, help us to leave through these walls with the message that we can share with others, Father, but also to keep giving us endurance and stamina to go through the trials and temptations that we may go through. Lord, we just thank you as we humbly pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. All right, so this chapter begins with, with God calling Jeremiah, and he says, go downtown and go see this potter. Now, pottery was a really familiar uh, job in the ancient world. It was very essential. I mean, that's what they hold all their water in, their wine in, their grain in. Any kind of material that you could think of, probably not clothes, but would be held in these pots, in these vessels. So pottery was very familiar not only to Jeremiah, but also to all of Judah. So this is like similar to whenever God uses the shepherd. They're familiar with this language, and so they'd be familiar with this too. And so, as we could see here, that um, 
pottery is really interesting in the ancient world. So what they do is they, ha- they sit down and they have these two wheels and they start moving their feet really fast. And then that's how they move the wheel and that's how they shape the clay. And it's a really messy process. And so, if, and so it, one that, it's, as we said, it's a messy, it's a dirty process. And that, you know, we have um, this clay, wet clay can be thrown everywhere. There's grime, there's dirt getting in the potter's fingernails. And that this is a messy process and that it can go on all day. Additionally, for pottery, that it's kind of lengthy. Normally it takes about three and a half weeks to make one pot. So there must be a lot of time and investment to go into this pottery that this potter is making. And then lastly, it's kind of personal. Each pot is different, it's unique, and it's how the potter designs it and shapes it. And here's the most important detail, is here in verse 4, uh, when the, but when the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into, the, into another vessel as he pleased, and the, pot, the potter would make it we see here that the potter does not give up on the clay, but he just begins to work again. He does not give up whenever the pot, whenever the the, one of the sides may go lopsided, whenever the bowl may break, whenever it may begin to crack, but instead he just continues to work on it. Now notice it says that it's when the clay spoiled in his hand. This isn't a skill issue that the potter messed up on his own part, but it was the clay that messed up. And so it is this that is very familiar to Israel, but now, or to Judah, and now God is saying, hey, look at this, I'm about to teach you something about me. So after we've had this quick history lesson on pottery in ancient Israel, let's keep going in the scripture in verses 5 and 6. And the, word of the, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, am I not able, house of Israel, to deal with you as the potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. God is our potter. And as we see from the previous uh, part, that the potter molds as he pleases. So we could make the connection with, like, with him being the potter, him being uh, us being the clay, his creation, his people. So let's remember you know, what it thinks to be a potter. One, we know it's messy. There's, it, we could think about uh, how his fingers are covered in dirt, covered in grime. Well, likewise, our relationship with God is kind of messy. Think about Israel and their time. From the second that they were saved from the, from the Egyptians, that they were brought across from the Red Sea, they were complaining. They were living in rebellion. They were seeking other gods. Uh, the book of Judges is a book that records their messiness with God and how they, uh, to do, they, they sought this. It's summed up in this one verse in Judges 21-25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Even after David and Solomon, two kings who gave this uh, the, uh, expectation of this is what it means to be a biblical king, this is what it means to be a godly king, there was and just tons of evil kings followed. Israel has had a messy history with God. It wasn't the prettiest, but yet God remained faithful and he continued working. Likewise, we could say that in our own lives. Sometimes our walk with God is messy. Sometimes we go to church not because we are thrilled that we get to see other, uh, our brothers and sisters, not because we are excited to worship God, but because, you know, I have to go today. Not I get to go today. Or perhaps maybe we're only praying to God right now as a, as a last resort. I've, I've tried everything that I can, and now I have to go to God instead of us always dwelling with Him and abiding with Him. Perhaps that uh, we are... We have just disregarded God in our lives and that we are no longer really, like, there's the joy of salvation seems to be gone. This is what Judah was going through at this time. This, uh, they were going through the motions. And perhaps that's where you may be at today or maybe as you are going through trials, it just seems like, where is God in all of this? It's messy. Life can be messy and so our walk with God can be messy. Next, we see that, you know, it takes three weeks and a half just to make one pot. It's lengthy, and God's been working on Judah and Israel and working on us for a while. I mean, just think of thousands of years ago, whenever Adam and Eve took of the fruit, and and as just spoiling the clay, but yet we see God still working with us despite all that time, that God is still moving. We see that, one, just through the Bible, through history, and even today, that despite 
uh, us messing up, God is still working. It is just that He has not given up. It is a lengthy process to make us into what He wants us to be. We could even just think personally into Judah's history of who they are for hundreds, probably, probably at this point, th- about a thousand years, um, maybe a little longer that, uh, since God has called Abraham. And that Abra- He promised Abraham, I will make you a great nation, that you will be a great multitude, and you will be a blessing to all the people. But look where Judah is right now. They're not a great nation. They're falling apart. God is still working with them. Even though it may take time, God is working with them. And I think likewise where, where we are. We could, I think we could say the same, that one, uh, just of all the, the historical events that has led to where we are now, could be the founding of this church, it could be Christians coming to America, that this process of time, God has been working for you to hear the gospel. I saw this uh, video the other day, and it just... Uh, just like genetically, how many people it makes to take you. And they came to this really big number, and I'm sure it's even bigger than this, but just like your like grandpa- like parents and grandparents and great parents, it, it, take, it takes at least like just like 4,096 different people when you just like go from like grandparents to great parents to make you. And to think that God has been moving in all of that so that He can continue to mold you and to be with you. God is putting much lengthy effort so that He may be able to walk with you and be with you. And I'm sure that those who have been walking with God for several decades now, you could say, yeah, God's been with me for a while. And that He hasn't given up on me. He hasn't left me. And just lastly, as we just remember the the personal aspect of it, that one, that God has a unique calling for all of us, that God has, that we have this unique story with God. You know, we aren't all saved the exact same day. We weren't all saved saying the exact same prayer. We haven't gone through the exact same trials, but yet God is molding us. He is sculpting us uniquely. And that also just remember that He didn't cast us out just because we spoiled the clay. Uh, whenever we go back to the Hebrew, that word spoil, it means, uh, communicates this idea of corruption or decay. And that's what we are. We are corrupted. Whenever, apart from God, separated from God, we, do have, we have no good in us. Nothing that is worthy of any kind of blessing or honor and that we are decay, we are dead apart from God. But yet, he didn't say, ah, oh, I'm done. Okay, time to make a new earth. Earth too, humans too. No, he continued to work with us. He continued to be patient with us. Um, uh, we could see in, uh, in Isaiah 43, that uh, he says that, uh, but now this is what the Lord says, he who is your creator, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. This is where we see God's heart as the potter. God who is our creator, the one who has formed us, is still seeking to redeem us. He has not given up on us despite whatever sin we may have committed, whatever atrocities we think we, we have done, but He has continued to work on us. One just individuals, but also as a people, as He has humans. So this is one God's heart for us, and so we could say, hey, great, cool. God's working things out for me. Uh, uh, he is, despite my sins, despite my failures, He is still molding me. He's working on me. Cool. That's, this is not a, actually this is not for us to sit down and say, "All right, this is great. This is actually an invitation for us to join him in his work. If we read in verses seven through 10. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot it and to tear it down or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from an evil, I, I will relent from disaster or that, of the disaster that I have planned to bring on it. So he then begins to give some examples. God says, if a kingdom or a nation, which I have pronounced judgment on, essentially, decides to um, relent and decides to repent from their sins, I will pull back my anger and my wrath. This phrase that uh, he uses to um, a kingdom to uproot it or to tear it or destroy it is actually what God calls Jeremiah to do all the way in chapter 1. In chapter 1 and verse 10, he says that, he says that, he will, uh, that he, God is giving him the power to do this. So this should be resonating with Judah, who is familiar with Jeremiah's story, that sure, God could do this with any, any uh, nation, but for Judah, it should be, wait, God is pronouncing judgment on us, but he's, he's, he's saying that he's going to uproot us, that he's going to um, tear us down, that he's going to destroy us, but yet 
He's saying if we repent, he won't do that. This should be just light flickering in uh, Judah's ears and Judah's eyes. We also, he continues, he says, but on the other hand, he says, or at the other moment, I may speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. But if, that, if it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will relent of the good that I wish to bless it. Once again, this should just be light bulbs in the minds of Judah, in the minds of the Jews, because just this was also cool, and this was also a part of Jeremiah's call, just the next phrase that says to build up and to tear down the kingdom. But this is pointing back to Abraham for the Jews, that we know that in, uh, from Genesis 12 that God has called Abraham, uh, that it is through him that his people will be made great, that they will receive a land, a gracious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. There will be a great nation, and through that they will bless all people. And they, but God's saying, well, if they don't hear my voice, if they don't obey my voice, I will pull that away. This should be light bulbs going off in the minds of the Israelites, in the minds of, of Judah. And we can actually see this playing out in the Bible with the city of Nineveh. So, in the book of Jonah, after he gets swallowed by the well, after he spit out, he goes to Nineveh and he preaches this like two sentence message. It's the shortest like sermon we ever have recorded. It's like two. It's like uh, in four, repent in forty days and forty nights, God will destroy this kingdom. That's it. And but yet it falls on hearts who are willing to listen. And, then, and, it begins, and that message begins to spread throughout the city of Nineveh, which has been said to be a three days walk just to get from one end to the other. And it spreads, and it gets to the king, and the king says this decree that, that no one should eat for the next few days, not even a cow. Not, we should not tend to our gardens, but yet we should mourn. We should weep. We should be covered in dust and ashes, and we should repent. The Ninevites, these horrible people who have just, uh, th who, uh, these were actually the first people to begin to master the, uh, the art or the practice of crucifixion. These ruthless people have repented. And what does God do? He turns back his wrath. Um, it's really, it's, and then, you know, the, the next chapter in Jonah 4, you know, Jonah's all, you know, pouty because God said what he was going to do. God was a gracious God. But then, we go a few decades later, and we're now in the book of Nahum, and God and um, Nineveh has returned to their sin, and if anything, it's even worse than where they was before. Brutality on, on, in, on all ends, injustice, uh, mistreating of the poor and the needy, uh, and this horrific crimes in, in, throughout their empire. And Nahum starts by saying, God is slow to wrath. He is slow to anger, in which he was, and he gave mercy. But now since they are unrepenting and they are now not listening, Nahum cast God's judgment on them. And it's a, it's a really interesting book. Throughout the book, he kind of makes fun of them. He mocks them um, and the destruction that's coming their way. And then God, pronoun God pronounces judgment and he destroys them through Babylon. These people who were, oh yes, if you repent, you will... Uh, received this peace, and that's what happened. But then they went back to sinning, and then this is, and then so then they now and they won't return back, and so now they are destroyed. We see, we see this playing out in history, and we could even see it playing out here with Judah. Likewise, you know, we are also given a choice: rather, are we going to go with the potter's hand? Are we going to move with it? Or are we going to fight against and be as spoiled clay? Are we going to turn to God and receive blessing? Which is blessing is not something that you know. I'll you know, man. I hope I get a blessing today, or or uh, it may, it's not something that we just say before we uh, eat our food. But it is God's presence. Uh, th this idea of blessing is developed throughout Genesis, and it's really cool and it's really rich, and I love to talk about it. But we'd be here for longer than we should. But um, it's a really beautiful picture of God's blessing. It's mainly His presence and it is life. It is connection with the Creator, the connection with love itself. That is the blessing. It's not the land. It's not the uh, material possessions. It's not the uh, good circumstances, but it's God. And so is, is Israel going to turn and go back to God's blessing or are they going to continue and face destruction? And this is this choice that, we, that God gives us today. Are we going to continue and go in our sinful ways, our selfish ways, and receive destruction? Or are we going to turn to God and receive His life, receive His love? 
this, uh, this uh, part ends by looking at verses 11 and 12. And here it says, So now speak to the men of Judah against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, This is what the Lord says. Behold, I am, bef- bef- behold, I am forming a disaster against you and, des- and devising a plan against you. Now turn back, each of you, from his evil way and correct your way and your deeds. But they will say, It is hopeless. For we are going to follow our own plans, and each of us will persist in the stubbornness of his evil heart. So God just he makes it clear. He says, turn back. Come back to me. That is what, what repent means. Repent often, you know, people may think of it like a 180 degree, like making a U-turn, that I'm going in this, this path of, si- of selfishness, of sin, and I'm turning to God. Um, in the in the Greek, which this isn't Greek, this is Hebrew, but in the Greek, this word repent is often compared. It's where we it's called metanoia. It's where we get the word metamorphosis, like for butterflies, how a, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It is a complete change. So this word repent has really strong meanings. It's not just you know I'm just going to change my mind, but this is a this is a life change. This is a transformation, one that's only done by God, but it's because He's been given the opportunity. But He is inviting Israel once again. Hey. Come back to me. Something that he's been doing throughout Israel's history, through the Exodus, through the judges, through the kings. That He's always saying, come back to me. And he's been consistently faithful. But then he anticipates Israel's answer. No. It's hopeless. Why should I, why should I continue? And as, we know, as we, just, we know from history, and we could keep reading, we know that Judah doesn't turn. They don't turn their hearts back to God. And so what has to happen is God has to apply the heat. He has to mold their he has to use his hand to mold it, Judah into his into what pleases him. And this is might be kind of hard for us to grasp. Um, I think Romans Paul talks about this in Romans 9:19 9, and 23 and this is what let's see this is what he says. You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who has resisted his will? On the contrary, who are you? You foolish person who answers back to God, the thing that molded you will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does the potter not have a a right over a clay to form the same lump, one object for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath to make his power known, endured the great patience of objects of wrath prepared for destruction? Here's the important part. And he did so to make known the riches upon his glory, upon the objects of mercy which he has prepared beforehand. We see that even though we know that Babylon is going to come in and wipe out Judah, that's going to destroy the temple, that God is not done with Israel. God is still shaping the vessel, shaping the pot of what Israel is going to be. It is actually from the exile, from them living in Babylon, comes this expectation of who Jesus is. Despite Israel's outright rejection of God, despite all that He has done for them, God is still working a plan. He is preparing their hearts for Christ. He is preparing their hearts for Jesus to come. Remember Nineveh and how that city was wiped out by the Babylonians? In early church history, that area actually became a, night, a, a strong Christian place, a strong Christian, a stronghold for Christians. It is where what we call the church, the desert fathers lived. And those are people who moved out of the, uh, like the Roman Empire and lived in mostly abandoned areas. But these people were uh, selfless Christians who gave themselves up to serve their community. Despite the destruction, God was not done with that area of Nineveh. He was still shaping them for the gospel to come later. We may be going through circumstances in life today where it seems that it is hopeless. That I cannot keep going. I will just I will have to throw in the towel. But God has not thrown in the towel for us. He has not thrown the clay away. But yet he is continuing to work. He is continuing to work, and as it says, as Paul says, he did so so that the riches of his glory upon the objects of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for our glory, he is using, he is using us in our lives 
to share His mercy. Um, I don't know what trials, what, what struggles you are going through. If it just could be work is building up, family could be disheartening, uh, maybe feeling isolated, could be economic burdens, could be dealing with a death. What it may seem like, God has abandoned me. It is hopeless. We know that God is our potter. God is the one who has not let go, who has not given up, and is continuing to work. So move with the potter's hand. Live as clay. Cling to God. Hide in His hand. As that, why it may seem that He is applying the heat or is He applying more pressure. God is using this time to grow you. He is using this time to say, hey, I need to depend, to depend on God more. It is through these difficult times that we get to step that God is using us to clean more to Him. So, just like God is insisting Jeremiah, I just turn to Him. Turn to the potter's hand. Live as clay. Um, you, despite whatever it may, you may feel like you have been Judah and that you have been this uh, sinful uh, person that you have just left God, that you have strayed for God, and He will never take me back. Well, just like we see with Nineveh, and as we would see with, like, if, if Judah were to do it, God would take you back. He will accept you with loving arms, just like the prodigal son. God, Jesus says that his heart is gentle and lowly. It is for those who are suffering, for those who are alone, for those who are dying. Turn to God and be like clay. Join me in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your mercy, for your love. Lord, I ask that you just please be with us today as we just uh, go through life. Give us strength to continue to go to you. Lord, please be our solace. Please be our fort, our, t our temple, Lord. And as whenever the heat seems to be applied, Lord, please remind us that you haven't abandoned us, but yet you are continuing to be with us and work with us despite what failures we may, we may go through or what trials we go through, Lord, you are still moving. Lord, please just help us. Be with us now as we humbly pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.